1962, in his first election for political office, Jimmy Carter lost. But then he won. He won because he challenged the local political bosses' blatant election fraud. I'm Bob Summers, and this is a presidential story. Recently, it was announced that President Carter has entered home hospice. I'd like to send my thoughts and prayers to President Carter and the whole Carter family. President Carter has experienced so many amazing adventures over the years. As an homage to him, I'd like to share a few of those stories over the next three episodes. And the first of those stories takes place in 1962. The U.S. Supreme Court had just struck down Georgia's county unit election system. The county unit system was similar to the U.S. presidential electoral college system, but for Georgia state elections. Rural county votes could be 100 times more valuable than an urban county vote. This was leading to repeated election winners who did not win a majority of the popular vote. As Justice William O. Douglas wrote in this majority opinion, the concept of political equality can mean only one thing, one person, one vote. With an open state Senate seat in his district, 38-year-old Jimmy Carter decided to throw his hat in the ring 15 days before the special election. But that was plenty of time. It was assumed that the candidates under the county unit system would be elected in this new system as well. So they limited campaigning to only 10 days. Carter's opponent was Homer Moore, a warehouseman and peanut buyer from the same hometown as Carter's mother, Lillian. Moore was someone who Carter knew and respected, and he was also a Democrat. Because this was a very Democratic district at the time, whomever won this election would run in the general election unopposed. On election day, Carter was rushing from one polling place to another when his wife Rosalind told him that her cousin was seeing serious problems in Georgetown, the county seat of Quitman County. One of Carter's friends, John Pope, was sent to the courthouse to check it out. What he found was shocking. The local political boss, Joe Hurst, was helping Homer Moore. Hurst was requiring all visitors to mark their ballots on a table in front of him and telling them to vote for more. The ballots were then dropped into a box with a large hole in the top. Every once in a while, and in plain view, Hearst would reach into the box and discard some ballots. Carter called Luke Teasley, a political reporter for the newspaper in Columbus, the largest city in the area, to inform him of what was happening. Then Carter drove to Georgetown himself. Hearst didn't seem to mind that Carter was there watching him tamper with the election. Hearst's response was, This is my county. I'm chairman of the Quitman County Democratic Party, and this is the way elections have always been done. But you're free to talk to my friend, the sheriff, if you want to lodge a complaint. When the reporter, Teasley, arrived on the scene, he was amused that old Joe was up to his normal tricks. This Senate district was made up of seven counties. In the other six counties, Carter led by 75 votes. In Quitman County, the vote was 360 for Moore to 136 for Carter. That's a total of 496 votes. One problem, only 333 people voted. Moore was declared the winner. Carter went to the Democratic convention held in Macon that same week to lodge a complaint. He was ignored. His mother, Miss Lillian, was heard to say, Jimmy is so naive, so naive. Even Carter's closest friends thought he was just a sore loser and advised him to drop it to run again in two years. But Jimmy Carter was angry, and you won't like him when he's angry. Any further appeal would be taken up by the County Democratic Committee, led by Chairman Joe Hurst, and made up 
of his hand-picked members. There were also threats against the Carters. A stranger stopped by the Carter warehouse and warned Rosalind that the last time anyone had crossed Joe Hurst, their business burned down. The Carters were legitimately scared, but undeterred. Carter had a connection at the Atlanta Journal. The newspaper assigned a skeptical reporter, John Pennington, to the story. When Pennington arrived in Georgetown, he had a highly publicized confrontation with Hearst, which led to a series of juicy front-page articles that spread throughout the entire state. One of the items Pennington learned was that 117 voters had allegedly lined up in exact alphabetical order to cast their ballots. Many of these voters were either dead in prison or had moved far, far away. So by the time the appeal was to be heard in front of the Quitman County Democratic Committee, the hearing room was packed with Carter supporters willing to confront Hearst. But the committee's first order of business was a motion made by Moore's attorney to reject the charges. Hearst and his committee quickly and unanimously agreed with the motion. No evidence was accepted. No testimony was heard. The next step was a court challenge. To challenge the ballots, Carter's team first had to find the ballots. According to Hearst, all the ballots, stubs, and voters lists were in the box. So Carter's first question was, where is the box? The box was eventually found under the bed of Joe Hearst's daughter. The box was unsealed and there were no supporting documents, just the ballots, over 100 of which were sitting on top nicely rolled together with a rubber band. With no stubs or voters list, there was no way to determine which ballots should have been in the box. After their arguments were made in front of conservative judge Carl Crow, he said he would announce his verdict on Friday, November 2nd, but made no other comments. The Columbus newspaper reported on page 13 that Carter would lose the recount petition. On that Friday, Judge Crow decided that with no voting booths, no secret ballot, and no way to determine the true election results, that all Georgetown ballots were nullified, meaning Carter's name would be on the ballot for the state Senate seat without opposition on the following Tuesday. Homer Moore appealed to local Superior Court Judge Tom Marshall. Monday night, Marshall ruled that all names were to be stricken from all ballots in the entire district, all seven counties. So Moore and Carter would both be running write-in campaigns that started in six hours. This did not give those printing ballots enough time to make changes. So in two counties, Carter's name was still on the ballot. In the six counties that did not see interference from Hearst, the results were the same as during the primary. In Quitman County, however, the voters felt that for the first time, they were free to make their own choice. They voted 448 to 23 in Carter's favor. The overall tally in the district? Carter, 3,013. Moore, 2,182. Carter had won. Except, Moore decided to appeal directly to the Georgia Senate, whose presiding officer was Lieutenant Governor Peter Zach Gear, a close friend of Moore and Hearst. Gear had total control over the Senate and would essentially be selecting between Moore and Carter. It was not over yet. And Gear would not make a decision until the new legislative session started. There was a custom in Georgia to have a barbecued wild hog and whiskey dinner the night before the legislature convened. That year it was held at the Biltmore Hotel in Atlanta and there, Gear had a suite. The Carters went to go see Gear in his suite and saw Moore and his attorney leaving with large smiles on their faces. Either someone had just told a great joke, or they had just received some great news. The Carters feared the worst. The next day, Carter arrived at the Senate bracing for anything to happen, and without any further question or drama, Jimmy Carter was sworn in as a Georgia State Senator. And that is how 
with evidence of fraud and tenacity of spirit, Jimmy Carter began his political career. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe to hear more presidential stories. And please visit POTUS.com to learn more interesting facts about the presidents.